Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship, where we love you enough to tell you the truth. On these programs, you will be able to follow our expository study of the authorized King James Version as we read verse by verse through books and occasionally tackle important topics for the purpose of helping Bible believers gain a thorough and accurate understanding of God's Word. We now invite you to join us in our study. I thought it was interesting. I want to read you a little introduction here from the Schofield Bible to the book of 2 Corinthians. He says, The epistle discloses the touching state of the great apostle at this time. It was one of physical weakness, weariness, and pain. But his spiritual burdens were greater. Now, how many of you have been there? <laughs> These were of two kinds, solicitude for the maintenance of the churches in grace as against the law teachers. In other words, they were false teachers preaching a false gospel, and Paul was concerned about that. And anguish of heart over the distrust felt toward him by Jews and Jewish Christians. The chilling doctrines of the legalizers were accompanied by detraction and by denial of his apostleship. So we had to keep an eye on this is as Paul is dealing with the church here at Corinth, there are people attacking him as though he's a false teacher. And I mention that because that's really where we are. We just need to be honest. That's where we are. Um, the majority of Christians today would say that we're in uh, a cult because we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God and we don't go along with the big ecumenical movement. And so anybody who won't join up with the big one world religion thing, they label you as the divider and you are the heretic and you are in the cult. Nothing's new. If you've read the book of Acts, you've seen where they called the way that Paul and Peter was preaching heresy. And they referred to them as, we, the Bible uses the word sect, S-E-C-T, that's another word for cult. So really, Bible-believing Christians, from the very beginning, we've been known as a cult. If you read church history, you'll find out in the first three centuries, Christians were hunted down by imperial Rome because they were called an atheist cult. Why? Because we worshipped one God, but reject all their other gods, so they called Christians atheists. Then along comes Constantine, and, and your church history books are just full of baloney. <laughs> and they will tell you that Constantine, with his great edict of Milan, freed the Christians from persecution. Hogwash. What he did was he established a governmental system of Christianity that is called Nicolaitanism in the Bible. It's condemned. God says he hates it. And that false church set up by Constantine labeled all of you Bible believers who meet without the uh, approval of the government, you're a cult. And so they hunted you down. And they would hunt you down and imprison you and torture you and kill you. Off and on it was worse than other times. That then developed into what we know as the papacy in the Roman Catholic Church. And from uh, shortly after Constantine till up into the time of the Re Reformation and beyond, the Holy Roman Catholic Church under the Pope hunted down people like us because we were a cult. And they would kill you, they would destroy your property, burn your books, and they condemned you as heretics. And that's been church history. And so as you read where Paul is being outcast by people and said they're saying he's a false apostle. You may find that strange, but we really shouldn't. <laughs> True Christianity has always been the outcast. We've never got along with the kings and the governors and the princes and the you know, presidents, the IRS, <laughs> the CIA, the FBI. Now, if you're a little group of people and you're all carrying semi-automatic weapons and planning and plotting to overthrow the government, you deserve to be you know, at least busted up and taken down because that's not our calling. That's not a true church. That's a militia. That's not a church. And so we don't call on people to arm yourselves and prepare for rebellion or anything silly and non... I mean, this, that's not our calling. But isn't it interesting? Here we meet, and that's the way it's been for 2,000 years. Christians have met to preach and teach and learn the Word. And yet, without weapons, without trying to overthrow anybody, they hunt us down. 
And so that's what we see with the Apostle Paul. But uh, so here is Paul dealing with personal intimate issues with the church, but yet at the same time being told he's a false teacher and all that. So he's dealing with all that. And that's where a lot of his heartache and everything that we've read about comes from. And then we, uh, last week we, we discussed how that th there was this situation with a man who had his father's wife. And they were living in sin and um, openly involved in adultery and fornication. And I want to look at that real quick. Go to 1 Corinthians 5. And I want to say as we look at this, I, I've never personally had a situation in a local church this bad, this evil, this disgusting and perverted. Never had that. So it's good that this is in here because this is an extreme situation and we see how it was handled. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll just read verses uh, 3 through 5. Um, I'll read verses 3 and 4. For I verily, as absent in body and present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done, uh, so done this deed that I just referred to. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, read verse 5 with me, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now that sounds like very harsh words and instructions, but you're doing an act of love. If someone is living in open sin and rebellion, and all you do is pat them on the head and say, oh, everything's okay, or don't, you know, pretend it's not going on, that's not love. Love would be to confront them lovingly and say, you know, this is sin, this is wickedness. You need to stop, and if you don't, we can't just let you come in and out here and act like nothing's going on. That's, that's when you prove you love them enough to really put yourself in that uncomfortable position. What you're really saying when you won't confront sin and deal with it is that you don't love them enough to put yourself in that uncomfortable position. I've said that about parenting. Parents don't do what's easy. They do what's right. And yes, you don't want to become an illegalist browbeater that, you know, your kids can't stand you. But at the same time, if you see your kids doing something that is in need of correction, and you've got to take action, it may be uncomfortable for you, but because you love your children, you'll do it. None of us really want confrontation. <laughs> I mean, I'd just like for everything to be smooth. You know, wouldn't you? I mean... Mike and I, we, we've been in, we worked together for now for how many years? It's been whew, seven years of great tribulation. <laughs> we don't work exactly together, but we're in the same area. And we've seen how many times where we've had to speak up. Now, there's times where you just have to let it go. But there's other times where you have to speak up and it becomes uncomfortable. But you know what? We care. <laughs> and we show we care about our job when we speak up just as much as we show we care about our families and our churches and our country. I've been blocked by about two-thirds of the people on Facebook who have befriended me. And you know what? I, I knew that it was probably coming. But you see, I'm not worried about them liking me because I didn't say anything to them personally. And I haven't said anything that's not true. And I didn't say anything that wasn't done in love. But if they can't and don't want to handle the truth. And they are going to ostracize me for just being honest and not playing the PC games. At least I will stand before the Lord with a clear conscience that I presented the truth. And if they've then blocked me and won't see what I'm posting and comment, then I've done what I'm supposed to do. And uh, I think that's Paul's attitude here with Corinth, and it should always be our attitude. There is prayer and wisdom and being patient. Paul didn't run to Corinth and start, you know, whipping people. He showed some patience and, and long suffering. Go back to uh, First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter two again. And now we see the motive behind Paul's instructions. That person needs to be basically set apart because we love them enough to tell them the truth. Amen. And then in verse 6, he, here's the same Paul. 
And he says, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. So the church of Corinth listened. And they set this man aside and set, put him apart so that through the destruction of the flesh the soul might be saved. And what he says in verse 7, so that contrarywise ye ought uh, rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. You see, Paul loves this man. He's not out to kill the guy or have him destroyed. Now he's speaking on his behalf and saying, now, now he's, he's learned his lesson. Verse 8, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Huh? Bingo. <laughs> that's, that's what Catholics say today, amen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I cracked myself up. <laughs> my mom's always said that. If no one else laughed at my jokes, at least I will. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful to see somebody deal with somebody honestly? I'm not a big fan of the guy, but I'll give Dr. Phil credit on a few times when I've seen him. He ain't afraid to take somebody on and say, you know, this is how it ought to be. Now, I don't always agree with him. I'm not endorsing, you know, there's some things he says I don't agree with. But I like anybody who at least stands by their convictions. The mealy math type, that's the kind you can't trust. You may not agree with Dr. Phil, but I think you are getting the real Dr. Phil when he talks. You see what I'm saying? Now, uh, look what he says in verse 9. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. So the reason, one of the reasons Paul wrote was he wanted an answer so that he could see, were they listening? <laughs> so there's follow-up there. He cares. Now this isn't very popular what I'm going to say, but it is true. There's nothing in the Bible that says that you must forgive someone who is not asking for forgiveness. Someone who has not repented. That's a false teaching you'll find in all the books in the bookstores. Now, the, I'll, I'll defend them on this. What they'll say is, for your own sake, you should forgive them. So that you... But see, that's the problem with it is, is that's not what Paul's driven by here. Paul's not driven by Paul. Paul's not dealing with this so that, oh, I just want this off my mind. <laughs> I can't sleep at night. This is, you know, that wasn't Paul's. Paul's motivation was the person who was in sin. See, the modern books are basically to hell with the person who's living in sin. Let's worry about you. So let's forgive, you know, just kind of an empty, flighty kind of forgiveness without any repentance, without anybody asking for forgiveness, but it'll make you feel better. See, that's the way a lot of people give. Give to charity. They don't even care whether the charity is sound and whether charity is trustworthy and whether the charity is preaching the gospel when they're dealing with people's needs. And we ought to care about that. But they just give because it makes me feel better. And they'll even say, if you give, it'll make you feel better. This is, you know, I, I give because the guy has a need. And I, I know that this ministry, direct line ministry, I know that Jimmy Hood down there at Charity Mission, I know they're going to take the money we give them and they're going to meet needs. Not just the tummy. They're going to feed them and preach the gospel to them. Give them a little food and give them the keys to eternal life. <laughs> I get excited about giving to that kind of guy. That kind of ministry. And so, uh, let's just go ahead and look at the words of Jesus Christ on this. Luke chapter 17 settles the matter. Luke 17, and in uh, Luke 17, verse 3, I want everybody there, and then we'll read it together. Okay, read that with me. Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Now mark that in your Bible. Mark it down somewhere, not in your Bible. <laughs> <laughs> But if that Bible you got is your Bible, <laughs> mark that. <laughs> because this is just a quick, easy reference to straighten up some heresy that's out there. That Jesus says, number one, uh, let's, let's realize that it's, it's none of your business, then it's none of your business. Jesus says here, take heed to yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee. So first thing you need to ask is, is this my business? <laughs> 